Hey, welcome back everybody to the 40th episode of my podcast. And because it's a special episode, we had to have a special guest on, Coach David Thorpe from the US came on the podcast today and we talked about player development, the art of player development. He's the first of a kind who started this profession. And we talked about the relationship building aspect of the of the player development coaching, as well as the epidemic of not enough coaching out there. Because a lot of coaches, a lot of head coaches are more managing the game and not really focusing on the players itself. We talked about the mental aspect of players on how, what causes the mental collapse of players, how to get them out of it, how to help them, how to develop not only the player, but also the human being. Lots of good nuanced conversation, as you know, uh, also about communication and philosophical parts of the game. So please tune in, please subscribe to this channel. Please share if you liked it, if you think somebody can benefit from it. And uh, I'll see you on the 41st episode. Bye. All right, coach. Good to, good to have you here. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Um, I, I know we haven't met before, uh, so I just prepared some, some things. And uh, thanks to Ryan Panone's podcast, we got in touch. So if, if there's um, anything that you can share about Ryan that, that just, just for, for, uh, for a story uh, to um, have Ryan listen to it as well, please share. So yeah, I've known Ryan. I don't, I don't remember. I've listened to all the things that he's been on. So I don't remember what he said to you, but he and I met when he was 19, I want to say. So almost half his life ago, because I think he's 37, 38 now. Yep. And um, he was just a teenager looking to get more involved in player development. And he, he said, I'm a high school coach. I have a gym. And, and I had been training players at that point quite a while already. And uh, he was just really eager and very raw, very, very aggressive in how he coached. Quite frankly, he was kind of a jerk to people, as he and I talked about. And uh, meanwhile, he's just the sweetest, fun, most fun. I love Ryan like I love my own children. And uh, he knows that. And I tell him that all the time. He tells me he loves me all the time, too. We have a very close relationship. But I said, stop being a jerk to everybody else. Like, you're not a jerk. Uh, he was just an act that he thought he was trying to play. And then when he let his true personality out, he just developed a million friends. He's such a good person. He's a really, really dedicated, talented coach, dedicated family man, dedicated friend. I probably, Ryan probably calls me four times a week. I get a text from him pretty much every day. And um, yeah, he's a very, he's going to be a great, and it, probably an NBA coach, but maybe a European team will snatch him up. Maybe a college team will snap him up. But if I was running a team, I would hire him and I'd give him a 20 year deal. Uh, he's, he won't get lazy. He is a dedicated, ambitious guy and his players love him. I agree with you. He, he said the same story when you, you, you sat him down and you told him to stop being a jerk. And I think, we can get into that a little bit later because I prepared some topics that are really um, all-encompassing, not only player development, but also communication-wise, uh, because that's my specialty. I, I love communication, the topic with not only talking with players, but also amongst coaches and mentoring each other. I think there's a big gap um, in between in between Europe and the U.S. in terms of mentoring coach, coaches mentoring coaches. And in Europe, you find a lot of times, and I've seen it, I've experienced, but I also uh, observe or hear about it a lot, where there's a lot of insecurity issues amongst coaches, head coaches, that are afraid to lose their position to their assistant coaches. But in a essentially, you are trying to raise other coaches to help you coach better. And in the U.S., I think there's a much better culture in terms of, I'm sure there's some insecurities as well, but there's a much better culture of helping each other and helping to get better better staff around you in order to help you and then grow as a staff, grow as a personality. And I think that you, that what Ryan was talking about as well, just the mentorship aspect. So would, like, I was wondering what's your philosophy in terms, of, in terms of mentoring other coaches? Well, I was lucky enough to be mentored by some pretty amazing men. Uh, there's a, a just retired head coach from college named Lon Kruger. That was a great mentor to me. Coach Buddy Heald at Oklahoma. Uh, one of the best college coaches we've had in, in, in the NCAA in the last you know, 20 years or so. Um, he had an assistant named R.C. Buford one year, at, who's now running the Spurs, who really helped me a ton. I, their starting center on the Gators team played for me in high school for four years. He was, he was one of their best players. For, he started for three years for them, went to the Final Four in 94 with them. That was the R.C. was there. So R.C. 
I would drive up on weekends. University of Florida is two hours from my home, two and a half hours. It's where I went to college. And he and I would get on the court and, and just player develop stuff. Just the two of us. We'd go through the drills we were doing. Uh, and, um, and they had another assistant named Ron Stewart, who just died in November, tragically, of a heart attack. He was in a, 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 head, a high level scout for the Bucky Bucks. And he also treated me amazingly well. So I had those kinds of people in my life. And I don't know, it's to me, I, I wouldn't say it's a philosophy as much as uh, I'm, I've been married um, a long time. We got married in 1990. And my wife would, would not necessarily want to continue to stay married to me if I wasn't a giving person. So it's just a natural outgrowth of just caring about people. I don't think I'm anything special. Ryan was a great guy. Why wouldn't I mentor him? I, I mentor media because I'm in the media too. I'm, a lot of journalists I've mentored, a lot of agents, NBA coaches, NBA executives. I was the, kind of the first guy to bring Masai Ujiri into America, introduced me to a bunch of people. He didn't need my mentoring, but, but a couple of years and he outgrew me. Um, but that's just, that's our, that's what we're supposed to do. We're, we're supposed to be in the business to inspire. We're supposed to be in the business to help young people. Basketball is a way to do that. It's a vehicle for us to reach them. I'd, I've had, what I used to coach teenagers, right? In high school, and I had parents call me, can you, my son's not making his bed. Or my son wants to wear an earring. Or my son wants to keep his hair long or whatever. And because I coached their child in basketball and I coached them well, I, it gave me a voice to their brains that maybe their parents didn't have. And so that's incumbent upon me to take advantage of that. I feel like, I have and, and try to continue to do that with my all my MBA guys that I've helped now over the years. And uh, of course, it, it's the same thing with players and, and coaches. Uh, we're all in the same game here. We're all supposed to be helping each other. I don't see any other way to do it but that. Yeah, that's that's it's an interesting point. Like you said, there's you give it gave you a voice to mentor him or to to tell him to tell him something to accept you as a as an example of how to act or how to behave. But there's also some sometimes there's a line that you have to have a feel for people, right? You have to understand of what's the line. Where can I do? Am I crossing the line here? Am I not crossing the line here? Where where do I stop because the person is not uh, accepting right now of, of mentorship, whether it's a player or a coach. So I think there's a lot of of uh, also the more people you know, I call it the spectrum of people. The more people you get to know, the more people you, the more different colors you are able to recognize, the better you are able to reach different different personalities. Well, it's true. When I was younger um, and, and not as well known, I, it wasn't as easy because why would they listen to me? Who was I? Yeah. To be honest, I, I'm going to be 58 in two weeks. I've had you know a fair amount of success in a business that um, I kind of invented, player development business in, the, in 1993. And so if you don't listen to me now, you're just an idiot. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this a long time. I've made I've made a good living. Um, our first dog was named Spalding. Our next dog now is named Wilson, named after the basketballs that help pay our bills. Like I, I've I figured this out. I've done this. And so if you don't listen to me, you're just foolish. Uh, I don't find that to be the problem. I think I think most people, and I and I can say this definitely about players, uh, they just want to get better. And most coaches that I've met, they just want to get better. And so. And I'm never, I don't ever think that only, it's not a one-way street. I always told, I even, I've got some very talented young players in the NBA. And I even tell them, this is not a, a lecture class. This is a discussion class. Like, you're supposed to be talking to me too. You're supposed to ask me questions. You're supposed to bring up things. I don't know necessarily that I'll have the answer right away. Give me, give me a chance to look it up. And I will. I'll, I'll spend some time trying to give you the best answer and you should do the same for me. And this is how it's supposed to be. And uh, I find most coaches to be very, uh, they're very willing to play that game of, I'll take as much as I can from you, but coach, if I can give you something back, I'm happy to do it. And I, and I always want something back. I like, yeah, that's, it's a two-way street, definitely. You, yeah. you feel, you, it can never be a, a, a uh, uh, how you call it, just um a downward, downward stream, right. you know, like it has to right. be, it has to be both ways. So what is, I have things prepared. I'm just going to jump back and forth. But what's what are some things that you may have learned from players that uh, after you taught them something or they, you, what are some things that you that jump to mind right now that players taught you? It, it's a long list, but I'll, I'll share with you a few. Well, well, first of all, let me say this. I learned this um, just by viewing 
my players that I coached in high school. Uh, I worked at camp one time. Uh, it's a very good division two program here in Florida. And we did team camps and my, my, I was a JV coach. I was 23 years old and our varsity coach would let me take the team every summer to team camp. So he, he, he taught summer school. So I didn't. So he, it gave me a chance to coach our varsity players. We had lots of college bound players and we go to these camps and a lot of these camps were, were wealthier kids who the coaches coached their butts off. They really ran a lot of complex, very European tactical stuff. This is back in the 80s, all right, and early 90s. And my teams kept it simple, and we kicked their ass all the time by a lot of points. They weren't competitive games often. And one time, and, and the, I was young, and these older coaches who been around a long time didn't like me. because I, I was definitely arrogant and brash like Pannon. I learned my lesson years ago. But the head coach of this camp who became an NBA coach, he, he had a big meeting with the other coaches. He said, all of you are, are always trashing Thorpe. He's not a good coach. He just has good players. He said, well, how do you think they got those good players? He's like, have you guys figured out that if he tried to play like you, his teams wouldn't be as good. You're so you're trying to run stuff. Our colleges don't run well. He keeps it simple, lets his talent win and coaches them to play really hard, execute their strategy. And that this guy said, do you, do you notice? His team are the games that we're coming to see. We're not coming to see your sorry team play. We don't, we're not coming to see you coach. We're, we're coming to watch his teams. And by the way, we recruit his players all year long. We watch this guy coach them. He's running player development stuff for his guys when they're 14, 15. So that was the first lesson. Help your players be better as players. You can run whatever the hell you want to run after that. So that was lesson one. But there's little things like you, you may remember a player named Gal Meckel. So Gal was a client of mine forever. Once he, once he got to Haifa, I trained him before he went to Haifa. Then he went to the NBA, whatever. So he's still like a son to me. So Gal taught me the hostage dribble. I had seen hostage dribble when you occupy that defender from behind, but I didn't have a name for it. And I, I don't remember if he named it for me or not, but as soon as you name something, you label it, you have better command of it. You can communicate it more. So that's something that, that I, I learned directly from him. He also taught me, the value of the elusive screener. So the screener that quickly gets away from his guy, whether it's a, a step the wrong way and then go to the ball or just racing to the ball, that elusive screener whose own man isn't attached to him has a better chance to set a great screen and make something good come out of it than the guy that kind of jogs up to the ball, even if there's not a shot clock, which of course in the pros there is. So that's two of many things I picked up from players that uh, that I, I still teach to this day. Elusive screen. I never heard of that. I, I mean, I have the you have the idea for it, but you don't. I don't. I you know, elusive is definitely a good um, explanation for 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 what 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 your eyes see, but you can't really uh, yeah uh, verbalize it. Um, that's right. one thing that you said of sim simplifying the game, and I that comes yeah. to mind. What's currently really uh, what I see a lot, but. And I go back to until in my clinic that I had last week, but also that's I, I trademark this term, all right? So everybody who's listening, I trademark this term. I haven't done it yet, but officially it's going to be my term: over basketballing. So a lot of coaches and a lot of it's just exactly what you said that are just over basketballing because of trying to be perfect in the sense of running the right stuff, the perfect stuff that is going to get you open and the spacing is going to be excellent, perfectly correct. But you take away so many other opportunities to score for players to shine in their own spots where they prefer to get it, that you are taking away the biggest majority of your advantage in order to maybe attack that one specific mismatch where you are probably already had another advantage on the other end. That's just one example, but an over basketballing term, I think, is something that's very prevalent in, in, in today's basketball. I think in the NBA it's less so because it's, there's a lot of also analytics involved, but in general, in Europe, you still see a lot of, of yeah. over, overthinking. And, and, and yeah, we, we, we call it overcoaching, yeah. uh, but you can, you can over basketball as a player. You can overcoach as a coach. Uh, there's a great movie. It was the best movie of the year a long time ago in America called Amadeus, which is it's the story of Mozart. And Mozart is playing a, a, an opera for the king of, of, I don't remember what country it was. It might've been, it might've been France. And um, I don't remember. And um, maybe it was Italy. And the king said, there's too many notes. And Mozart said, no, there's exactly as many notes as there needs to be. Well, I trust Mozart before I trust the king. 
So to me, the, I, I have a book, as you may know, called Basketball is Jazz. Okay. So there's a right way to play jazz. You can have too many notes. You can have too few notes. The goal is to get that happy medium. That's our job as a coach is I want to have some structure, but not so much structure that our players can't play jazz and play freely. On the other hand, I don't want to have no structure at all. And then you have just bad shot after bad shot without people taking advantage of the players. So as an example, last night, the Lakers are playing the Nets. The Lakers have a starting center named Thomas Bryant, who is an unbelievably talented offensive paint scorer. And he shoots threes well. Uh, he, he took, he's shooting 40-something percent from three, and they almost never run pick and pop for him. And the Nets were switching screens, and they were getting – Kyrie Irving on him and they went an entire first half and not once did they look to get the ball inside to this very, very good paint score against, uh, by the way, Kyrie Irving is a great offensive player and he's not a bad defensive player, but he can't guard Thomas Bryant. And if he can, he's got to exert some real energy to do it. But the Lakers don't really think that way. LeBron didn't play. Anthony Davis didn't play. They're just out there hooping. So that's an example of someone who's applying no real tactics to what the team is doing. I've had many clients. I've probably had 100 European players in my career. I think I've had like 98 or 99 NBA players, maybe 150 Euro League, Euro Cup kind of players. In, in Europe, they tend to overdo it, in my opinion. Yeah. They, they, tr they try to make it really complex without the need for that. I understand why they're doing it, but the, the best coaches find that happy medium, I think. I agree. It's there's, there's the, the spacing issue is ob obvious for sure, but it's still there's some privilege. A hard framework and a loose framework and finding the happy medium. And just to add to the notes, notes uh, example you said, or the, uh, um, how you say it, English word, um, just the, the, the metaphor. Um, yeah. The pause, pause is also part of the notes. So the pause is also part of the song. Sometimes you have to know also right. when, when to stay away, when to, when to be quiet. And this, that's a lot of, that's the communication part and coaches, I think, to also know, when to just be be on on mute <laughs> for a oh, while. Oh, I, I really am I'm really glad you brought that up. I don't I don't really talk about my consulting business, but I help NBA players in season, not just off season. But I, I, I work with them in season. And I'm very, very particular about looking at each of their schedules and picking days where they're not going to hear from me. They're not going to get clips from me. They're not going to get notes from me. They're not going to get a phone call from me. Purpose. Uh, our, our schedule is too long. We play 82 games, plus preseason, plus postseason. Um, I'm probably in their head more than any of their own coaches, in part because NBA coaches don't really coach much anymore. They just play you. They might, they might have you play a certain strategy, but they're not really working with you individually the way people like I do. And so I don't want my players to be desensitized to my voice. And so, And I also want them to have a life. As much the players who work with me are hoopers. They really want to be good. They want to study tape. They want guidance all the time. But there's too much of a good thing. So I will tell them, go, go see a movie, go hang out with your girlfriend. Go if you have a family, you know, take the kids out somewhere, go ice skating. I don't care. But you're not going to hear from and I tell them ahead of time, you're not going to hear from me tomorrow. Don't even look for your phone. Don't expect a note or a clip. You need to take a mental health day. And it's also a break from me. And I do this as a dad too. My, my twins are, I have a boy, girl, twins are 21. My son plays college basketball at Florida state. My daughter's a student and very involved in a sorority. And as they aged through middle school and high school, I pulled back more and, and not less and just was available, but they kind of have to figure life out on their own. And I'll step in when I'm needed. That's my job as a father, as a parent, I, I partnered to, to my wife, their mom on that. But this to me is the same thing as with your players. You, If you overdo it, you, you, you keep fr them from learning a little bit more on their own. Sometimes I'll even send clips to a player of the shot to say, or maybe a pick and roll read. What do you see here? I, I do this a lot, actually. What do you see? Number one, they might see something I didn't see, especially the smarter players that I have. The younger players tend not to see much, but I force them to think. That's part of it, too. If I just force feed them, they're, you're, you're, you're sucking the opportunity for them to learn. And failure is incumbent in learning. You have to fail. You have to make every mistake. I tell every NBA player, every rookie goes through the same mistakes that the five-year players do. I always tell them, there's no such thing as a rookie mistake. It's a stupid thing to say. Here, here's why I know that. You ever watch LeBron play? I have. I watch every game LeBron plays. He has some of the dumbest passes you've ever seen. 
and he's one of the greatest passes of all time. Chris Paul has made some of the worst decisions ever in basketball, and he's the point guy, deservedly so. It's, it's a game of mistakes. You have to make them all. The better players just don't make them nearly as often as the players that aren't as good. And so as a coach, you have to, to sit a guy down for a mistake drives me crazy. Now, five mistakes in the same quarter, different yeah. story. Yeah. You've got to let these guys breathe. You've got to let them breathe. You've got to let them learn. It, I, I only yell at a player. I don't yell at NBA players. When I was coaching my son's teams and before that, if I don't think that player felt the pain of the mistake that I did, mm. a player that felt that same pain, I don't have to mm. yell. I can just teach. That's the great thing about the NBA guys. They don't want to screw up. They don't want to make a mistake. So you just have to point out with no emotion. Here was the problem. They're already angry enough as it is at the mistake that they made. These guys are driven guys to be in the NBA, right? So I that's I learned that as a parent too. If my kid, once my kids started caring, well, now I just had to provide the, the guidance and the analysis. I don't have to yell anymore. It was great. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's the that's that's you don't you won't find that in Europe a lot. <laughs> but, oh, I know. Trust me. I know. <laughs> but yeah. the over the overbearing part, I don't have children, but that's the I can imagine that overbearing part that if parents are just helicopter parents and the whole time just controlling at some point, you're just going to lose them just because the, yeah. the, the, the kids are not going to listen to you anymore, tune you out. That's the same thing with players. It's probably the same thing in, in business and in jobs right. when you have overbearing bosses. It's the same. It replicates each other. Um, what do you not tolerate about players? What's something that you are like yeah, that gets you or pushes you away from a player where like, this is hard. To, this is something that I will not your pet peeve basically. Oh, there's a few. So uh, willingness to work is what I love. An unwillingness to really work is a problem. Um, I don't really attach emotion to it. Um, I just move on. Uh, when I was a high school coach, if we weren't willing to work, that was a problem for me. If you're unwilling to learn, that was a problem for me. Uh, I don't mind if you're selfish unless I don't think you're capable of improving. Mm -hmm. So a lot of players are what I call me players. But our game has to be a balance of we and me. And so my job as a coach was to inspire the player to understand the more you understand the we aspect of this, the more successful the me part will be. And then you have some players like, for example, uh, two years ago, Scotty Barnes was a rookie with freshman at Florida State. And my son was a freshman on that team. And I thought Scotty was too much of a we player. He didn't assert himself. Uh, and I, but I ranked him number two in the draft behind Mobley. Uh, ahead of the other guys because I thought he learned part of the me game because the NBA, you have to be part of it. You have to be some me if you want to get the max deal, which these guys all want as they should. And so I think you can learn that. But if you're a me player and don't want to hear about the we, that, that's a problem for me. I, I'm not going to put up with that. I, I'm also, at the end of the day, we all, I lost my dad last January. It was 80. He was 81. He was about to turn 82. And Uh, it, it, I reflected a lot on what are we doing here on this planet, right? As, as many sons can say when they, they lose their dad. Uh, I, my favorite word in our language is decency. And so it, it, for me, if, if you talk to people who know me, I would hope they would say, oh, he's a, he's a decent man. But my wife thinks I'm a decent man. Her mom thinks I'm a decent man. Her sisters think I'm a decent man. Uh, I think my mom thinks I'm a decent guy. I know my brothers and sister feel that way. My kids do. Um, that's really important to me. So a player that isn't decent to others, uh, we're not going to see eye to eye. I'm going to try to inspire him to be different, but if they're just, if he just isn't decent, which I almost have never found, but I found a few. Uh, and then the last thing would be an unrealistic understanding of what's happening. I've turned down players that wanted to work with me in the draft back when I did a lot of pre-draft training. I turned them down because they were top five guys, but they told me they had to go number one. And I just felt like, well, there's no way you're going number one. And I'm just going to be blamed for you not going number one. I don't want that bad vibe out in the environment. We're just not going to work together. You need to have an understanding that, that you, as good as you are, there's probably someone better than you. There's probably someone that works harder than you. you we can aspire to, for, to, for better things. But the, the player that doesn't respect who else is out there is not going to have as much success as I'd want. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have much of a patience for that. But most of these NBA guys... They're quick to recognize. I was talking to an NBA point guard the other day who had seen Jaron Jackson for the first time in person. And I had told him, this guy's the next Rudy Gobert. And he, after the game, he said, he'll coach you right. He owned the paint. And uh, I love that. You have to respect these other guys 
And that'll help you in your career as well, I think. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I had that written down as well. If you like, if you're communicating uh, with let's call them delusional players who don't have a good reflection of themselves when they look in the mirror, they think that they're something, some somebody else. And you basically answer the question in terms of how how to do you try to convince them to be a star in their role instead of them trying to be a star of somebody that's not attainable. Or is that something that you just completely stay away, let them figure out themselves, let them fail first and then come back to you. And then you can, you know, work from the ground up. I always, but that's how I do it though, is I work yeah. from the ground up. So yeah. it's, um, I, I t- so this every morning I send clips to my players. I might send nine clips to my smarter veterans. I might send three to my younger guys, 19, 20 year old NBA players, because they can't process more than that. Mo- mostly they can't. And so we got to keep it simple. I want them to want more. Go watch more tape yourself then. I'm not going to fill your head and confuse you because you'll lose all of it. Yep. So none of them retain 100% or, or most of them don't anyway. The, the smarter guys have been around longer. It's more of a discussion between us. It's not a lecture because they're seeing a lot too. And um, I, can, I can send them more things. They have so many more reference points. So the word we use in technology is bandwidth, right? Yep. Yep. So... so uh, you and I have lots of bandwidth. My bandwidth is probably, to be honest, it's probably starting to shrink a little bit. <laughs> I'm not 40, right? At 40, 45, but I'm going to be 58. I don't feel like I'm 58, but I'm quite sure that I am. <laughs> I have a younger brother about to turn 56 and I'm two years older than him. Um, and so, but I have, I still have a lot of bandwidth. I can, I can watch four games at the same time and gather information and take notes and all of that. I couldn't do that probably when I was 22, 23. Uh, so players are the same way. The ones that have more bandwidth, you can send more things in those pipes into their brain. Uh, the younger guys, we got to keep it simpler. And I just tell them, you may want to, asp- you aspire for all these things, but we're not there yet. So, so that's they what they're there. It's a problem. So the young guys that you mentioned, now, now, do, you, do you feel like after being in a business for so long, you think like that has changed with the newer generation of how much they're able to absorb? Or is that has been, has been, has it been the same with the same age group over the de- last decades? I think it's the of- same, but the game is so much harder. Mm. The game was so much easier 20 years ago. My first mm. NBA client was Udonis Haslam in 2003, his rookie season. My first guy that made the NBA was him. And quite frankly, it was just an easier game. It was so incredibly hard. It's the NBA. He was six foot seven playing basically his forward center, power forward center. Um, but his, the demand of him is nothing. I have a 19 compared to my 19 year old, for example, that plays four, five, three in the NBA and everyone shoots threes and dribbles the ball and cuts. It's a, it's just a, the game, the game is played on a much larger piece of land than it used to be. And there's so many more guys with skill and that are weaponized. You know, you, you, you you used to not have to guard, go back to watch games in the seventies and eighties. Nobody was guarding outside the three point line, really except for maybe just to pressure a ball handler. It, it, it's so much different now. So I think these players are every bit, the guys that, I, that bubble up to me that are in the NBA, they're every bit as humble and focused and willing to work as they ever have been. I don't see any change in that. I just think it's a much harder game to grasp and, and, and figure out. Information overloads another it just it's just too too much to absorb at, at times where th- that information has not been available, has not been verbalized at that time. Okay, so there's two parts to this. So that's one. There's too much to going on. The other part is there's no coaching. Mm. I, I this is something I've been talking a lot about on my podcast at True Hoop. Uh, I don't think our NBA coaches are coaching enough. The ones that are are great. There's too many of them are just playing their players, running their system. They're not taking their, their, their players out for coffee in the morning. They're not having dinner with them. I read the other day, the Oklahoma City head coach has coffee once a week with Chet Holmgren. Chet Holmgren will play zero minutes this year. So he's already doing more with a player that won't play than all of the players that I've helped in the NBA have done for years with their coaches. I've had players, all-stars, literally tell me that they've never talked to their coach in their life except for on the practice court about practice. One guy told me I'd walk by my coach in the hotel room. I'm sorry, in the, in the lobby on like an off day. He wouldn't acknowledge me. The same player told me the same coach once walked by him in the mall in the summer. And the player was like, Hey coach walked right by him. Didn't say a word to him. Like 
acting like I didn't know him. That that's a that's weird. That isn't common. But I don't think we're we're coaching these players enough. And and so because of it, I have a business. And there's other people who do what I do. We're coaching these guys up. The, the the coaches that are doing it really are helping a lot. There's a lot to learn from this game. These players are blank. They're not learning in college. It's a different game in college. Yeah. And it's not happening in college enough. The schools that are coaching you tend to win a lot because they're really coaching the players, not just recruiting good players. But I, I think there's a real epidemic of a lack of real coaching, getting to know the player, getting to know what makes them tick. How do they absorb information? How do you inspire them? Which I think business one of a coach is, is to inspire them. I don't think enough guys are doing that or girls. In fact, we need to hire more women, in my opinion. Some of them are really good at talking to players better than men. And they, many of our players grew up with a woman in charge. Like I've literally, this is a true story. I spoke to an NBA player this year who, who I noticed was, was looking at t- during timeouts, the female assistant. So I said to him, what's going on there? He said, coach, she's the smartest coach on the staff next to our head coach. And no one gets it. So I just absorb everything I can from her. Now, this player is going to be a big time player. He's smart. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have a lot of women that can help us coach better. And I, I don't think our teams have, have done enough to, to bring that, that talent pool into our league. It's, a, it's definitely a relationship based business. Uh, with, with, when you work with people, you have to be personable, you have to be able, you have to be approachable. And I think in the leadership position as coaches, you have to have that relationship with the player with each player especially with the ones that are on the bench to help them feel that they are contributing despite them being benchless because they hope right. they're hopeful to play so everybody needs to feel involved everybody needs to feel that they're in the same boat and to me that's the best part of the of, of the job that you are actually have a you have a, fr- a friend in the business let's say because it's it's to me it's a human beings you can't you can't just ignore human beings that you especially you're working with when you're expecting results and keep this thing, this, 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 put this wall up in order to have this professional quote unquote uh, relationship, because in, in, in essence, there is that differentiation between coaches and managers. And I think that, that a lot of, some coaches turn into managers. I think we're, we're in, in European football, European soccer, you have, they're called managers because they just have so all encompassing uh, roles on the team where they may not be able to touch on everything but they're trying to manage the whole the whole uh, uh, stratosphere there within the team in basketball it's a little bit smaller community and especially in Europe where the talent level is so dense there's a lot of there's a lot of density in terms of how close they are together and teams thrive that have the better chemistry and you can't just create it like that but teams thrive to have a better chemistry where there is a a um up and downstream dynamic both ways between the coaching staff and the players where everybody kind of feels that they are in the same boat and they're working for the same goal. And I think that it's, it's, um, it's under discussed. It's, it's just, it just becomes too cold of a business and that's not really um, emotionally rewarding at the end. Why, why are you doing this? Right. I, I, I was speaking to a rookie uh, uh, maybe a month ago and I told him, I said, listen, I have to love you like you're my own child. I said, here's what that means. I don't really, I told him this. I don't really love you like my own child. I, I, was, I was there when my twins were born. I was holding my wife's left ankle with my left hand and I had the camcorder in my right hand. We had camcorders <laughs> in 2001. So of course I don't love my players like I love my children. But I have to go through that process because if I don't, it means I'm just going to see them as a client or as a player when the, they play two hours a day maximum but they're human beings that have 22 hours to get through the day. And so I have to be sensitive to that part of their life, not just the basketball part of it. Uh, I had lunch with one recently. I asked him how the girl situation was, what's going on. Do you have a girlfriend? What's whatever. What's your nutrition? Like what's your, what's I talked to all my players. What are your eating habits on the road? What are your eating habits at home? You know, what are you doing socially to get out? Uh, on mental health days, what are you doing on mental health days? Are you getting out? Are you getting out somewhere in the sun? A lot of these players play in cold weather climates in the NBA and they're not seeing the sun. Well, you got to go do something outdoors and whatever. Like I have to coach that part of it if I want to get the most out of them as basketball players. And I think the part of that return is how they think of me. So when I text my players, I get lots of yes, sirs. I don't ask for them to say yes, sir. I don't think they say yes, sir, typically, but they respect me. Why? 
I'm an old man. I know a little bit of some of the game and I treat them with respect beyond their basket. All these NBA players have been hustled their whole life. Some of them by their own parents, by the way, I should add. Most of them, parents are fine. Not all. I, I have one player told me his mom sees him as, as, the ATM, as an ATM machine. That isn't ideal, to say the least. So they've all been hustled. I, I try not to hustle. And they pay me. But I'm trying not to hustle for it. I'll hustle for them. I want to make them better as players. But I don't want to be seen as someone that's taking shortcuts. I'm in it for the long haul. My job is to build your value so you can make more money. There's a process for that. And it's not just how you play on the court. It's how are you le- living and leading your life? And I was the same way. I'm happy to say as a high school coach, I'm very close or, or in touch with nearly every player I ever coached, including guys. When I first started doing my basketball academy in 93, I just was on the phone for an hour the other day with one of my big 6'10 guys who was a great high school prospect. Signed, he was, everyone recruited him. Dean Smith recruited him, all these guys. Now he's a multimillionaire businessman, father of four, married a long time. My wife and I were at his wedding um, when, he had, when he had no children. Uh, I, I, this is, I earned that because I love them beyond just being basketball players. I don't know any way to do it, but that way. Yeah, I think that's the right. That's absolutely to me. That's the right way. It's 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 a. I'm too personal. But I'm too. I'm really a sensitive person as it is. When I meet people, I open up sometimes too much. Makes people people feel uncomfortable, and then you feel like, oh, maybe I'm just saying too much. But I that's. I feel like you have to. You have to extend the hand your hand first of all in right. order you know, to to get the hand back you know if if nobody's extending the hand then we're going to stay in this in this unreal gray area so i'm i'm usually the one to to just approach and break the border and just to show on the trust you have to show trust to get trust i think so that's that's, right. that's where it starts so when when you get into players heads a little bit not not heads in terms of 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 uh, you know, manipulating them but understanding yeah. understanding them better What are what do you think are the most common reasons for players collapses during games or in going into slumps? Where do you think that originates from? And what do you think are the most triggers for that? Okay. So yeah, this is something I deal with every day of my of my career, right? Is this exact thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I deal with there's two ways to do it. There, how do you deal with great success and how you deal with failure? Right. I always tell my players, you stay humble or you get humbled. If you, if you don't have great success and then realize it could be gone tomorrow, it's going to be gone tomorrow for sure. Like immediately, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to be successful. So when players are struggling, there's a, first of all, we always have to look at mental and physical health. So I had a player struggle recently. It turned out he was, he was sick. Another player is struggling on defense. His back is killing him. Like those are factors you have to look at, right? Uh, overwhelmed senses. Young players especially don't have the same bandwidth as older players. And so if they're asked, for example, to be a primary defender every night in the NBA to go from James Harden to Devin Booker to Seth Curry to John Morant in a week, which happens all the time, that's – that, and you've, you've got to prepare. You can't just show up – in my opinion, you can't just show up to a game and play against those guys and expect to have any kind of success. So you've got to be a bear for details. You've got to know what they want to do, what they're most successful at. You have to have a creative, my job is to help create a plan for them to have success individually and then contextually with the team. And it gets to be too much. They tend to be, uh, one player said to me recently, I get up in the morning, I get notes and clips from you. I go to my walkthrough. I have lunch. I take a nap. I go to the game. We have film before the game. We have a meeting before the game. Uh, I play the game. I get home. I watch the game again. You call me. And then the next day, I said, right, that's the merry-go-round. What I always tell players is you have to get off the roller coaster of the league. It's already full of ups and downs. You have to find joy on the merry-go-round. That's the merry-go-round. But young players struggle with that merry-go-round because it's a lot. They, in college, they pay attention a couple hours a day. That's it. Not the same in the NBA. And so you have to make sure you get your off days positive. You have to make sure that, as I said to him, don't watch the full game after the game. I'm already sending you the clips, or the team is. The good teams are sending their players clips. It's overkill. Don't overkill it. You get what you need, and then nothing more. You have to manage that. The postseason is a little different. You can focus on one team. 
but th- in this season, it's a different player almost every night. It can be overwhelming. Then, the, then there's mechanical things. So because, because of an injury, for example, to your shoulder, let's say you're a shooter. And so your shot starts changing a little bit because of that injury. And that injury is healed. And now you're still shooting the new way that you started doing because of the injury with better range of motion and your shot gets screwed up. Well, that's a mechanical thing that we have to fix. So that could be a cause as well, right? Th- these are, these are the, the nature, this is the nature of the game. And then you, you find it on film. I sent a film today of a player. I took a snapshot first of his lower body was just so out of whack. When I teach shooting, I, I use a term I call stacking. So a stacking would be, if you think of a pole and like your weights have the hole in the middle in the weight room, and they just one on top of the other. Well, I want our body stacked the same way. So, so uh, knees over sneakers, and hips over knees, shoulders over hips, head over shoulders, stacked. I said, if you're, if you, do you ever watch the show Game of Thrones? A uh, little bit. I, I'm not into okay, that. Okay, you know, it's a violent show. I said, imagine someone yeah. stuck a pole right down the middle of your head, down your spine, into the ground, and you slid up and down that pole. That's how I teach shooting. I want to go up and down that pole. I want to be balanced all the way. So this player was all bent. He was, he was, his leaning left and he was leaning back and he missed a shot terribly. Well, I'm not saying definitively that was the reason. It just probably was because you haven't missed like that before all season. So when they're, when they get out of whack, sometimes maybe they're just rushing things or they're just not focused. We got to address it. Let's clean that up. Let's get stacked up. Let's get our shot right. What's your experience? Because I talk about slums when I was playing and uh, I was I was so like very immense, like just going into the gym and just shooting, shooting, shooting the crap out of it all, all day long. And it was when I felt like I was going to the slump, I was going into the gym. I was trying to you feel you feel weird, like everything looks okay, the same the way it's always looked, but it just feels weird. And then yeah. I f- it, it, it couldn't get it wouldn't get to a place where I felt better. I felt confident about the shot. It just felt like it was going off every time. Then I realized, and I'm wondering what your experience is, when you just get away from the gym for a week, you just don't go shoot. You just don't, don't go before you don't go after. Just get, your, get out of it, get your head right. And then after a while, it just comes back. Maybe after even on, during the offseason, if I, if I just take a couple of days off and just get away, all of a sudden my shot is just like new. And I don't like, what's the explanation there? Yeah, well, you, we're not machines. As much as we wish we were, we're not. Machines don't have to have a conscious thought. We do. And so we can, we can definitely overdo it. Um, there's a couple, a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, number one, I really do like getting away. I will tell players get away. Uh, especially, I don't like, I, in, in my workouts, Ryan Pinot will tell you, my workouts are about 45 minutes. Now, you're not going to walk easily after 45 on, a, on some days. We don't go hard every day. Maybe twice a week in the off season. Really hard. Most of my stuff is game speed. But I mix it up because some things you're not supposed to do fast. Part of this game is really slow. So on days where I'm not going super intense, I'll do more of those kinds of things. But we don't shoot for hours because they end up building, just grooving bad habits. I'd rather have good quality streaks than long, long hours. Some guys a little bit different. I get that. Uh, but I'll, I'll, do, you have, do you have a lot of coaches that listen to your podcast? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to give you a message to them and just hear me out on this. Uh, I was driving my family once in, uh, up the mountains in Colorado. And then, and if you're going up mountains and sometimes you go down to go back up even more is the way it works. And, um, I, we almost got in a horrible accident. We all would have died for sure. There was a a trailer in front of us that was coming off its hinges right in front of us. We could see the sparks of the metal and, and the, the other road below us was, you know, 200 feet below us coming down the mountain as we're going up. But again, we're going up and down and now we're going down as we're going up. And this hinge is about to come off and knock our car off the road. And I don't know how, but I just kind of calmed down and just navigated going, you know, 50 miles an hour. I made it through and my family was super stressed. They made us pull. I was fine. They made us pull off the side of the road. We got lunch. We talked it through. They were, you know, eight years old, whatever. And, but I know this, whenever my, my, my kids have been anxious I, I tell them, I, you don't have to come to me, but that same guy that got you through that potential tragic accident, like I'm right here. I'll, I'll, I'll help you figure this out. I'm your partner in this. So coaches, 
I do the same thing with my players. Uh, now you can't do it. I didn't do this when I was 22. I 22. I just, I was just there for my players. I don't know if I could ever figure shit out. I, what did I know about basketball? <laughs> but I know a lot now. I have a resume. I, these players call me. I don't, I don't go recruit anyone. I get the phone call from the player, the agent asking for my help. So you, you recognize that I can help you. Great. So I will tell them, we're, to, we're together in this. We're going to figure this out together. I'm not abandoning you because you're in a slump, whatever that slump is. And I'm a fucking genius. I tell them that. I, I don't really know if I am, by the way. They need to hear it. They need to know that you're not the doctor performing your first heart surgery when I need heart surgery. They need to know I fucking got this and I'm going to help you through this. And here's my methodology. And I tell them, what do you see? What do you think? I'm not saying I'll do this by myself as your savior. We're going to figure this out as a partnership. But just know I've done this before many times. I'm fucking good at it. Let's figure this out together. You're going to come out better because of it. They need to hear that. Just like my kids sometimes used to hear the same thing. We got this AP history test. We got this algebra, calculus, whatever. We got this. That's something that I don't think coaches do nearly enough. It's all the players. When the players win, the coach celebrates. When the players lose, oh, it's your fault. No, no, no. We're in this together. And give them that confidence that I got you on this. I can figure this out. We'll figure this out. We'll be together better because of it. I don't think coaches do that enough. Bottom, bottom line, it's, it is uh, if you want your players to be confident, you have to be confident in yourself first and sure. foremost. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, it's not going not gonna to do justice. Um, just let's move in the gym. Let's go, let's go into the gym a little bit. Sure. So the problematic uh, with on, on and off season that you also mentioned when you, when you do things in an off season, but there's a problematic also with off ball players. Let's, let's say three and D players in general. During the season, it's a little bit easier to work with them in, in groups and you work, you work with, your, with the spacing and you have them get their shots. How do you do it? How do you have them work in the summer when you, it's, it's not pick and roll base? It's not reading base. It's not that you have defensive, defensive players around where you have them handle the ball. You have to play off the ball where it's based on, on moving, cutting and being in the right position. How do, you, how do you help them get their rhythm and figure out where they need to stand? It's a great question. So there, there are, I, I'm no expert in music. I'm an expert in almost nothing except I, I'm an expert in this game and that's it. I can't do anything else. I'm pretty, in, I pretty much don't have talent in anything other than I'm a decent guy. Um, and I know it's about basketball, but I know in the music industry and the film industry, you can take a piece of music with a soundboard and you can isolate any sound, the French oboe, the saxophone, the piano, the jazz guitar, whatever. You can isolate all these things and just focus on that. And so that's exactly what we do in the off season in our training is I eliminate all the other things except you. So I create the scenario in their head. Here's what's happening. If, if, a, if it's a player on an NBA team, okay, let's say playing for Phoenix. Here's Booker. Chris Paul's doing this. DeAndre Ayton setting the screen. You're Cam Johnson. And we're isolating that movement and we're simulating that action. And we're going to repeat, get reps at that actual action. So everything we do is illustrative of a game. My job is my, use my, uh, uh, what, what coaches do now that I've seen, because I try not to get on the court too much. I try to oversee what other coaches are doing. This, uh, this summer, I spent a lot, I spent one time with one of the best players in the world and I was more the feature guy, but I had lots of help because he was so used to having three, four five coaches on the court at once. Coaches, managers, setting screens, cutting. I've never done that. I was just always just me. And so it was my job was to create, not obviously it was coaching five on five. Of course I did that. But on my, uh, my end, when I first opened my basketball academy in 1993, it was the only one on the planet that we're aware of. No one was doing, they were doing golf and tennis, individual coaching. Yep. Everyone was doing it for their own team. I was doing it for other people, right? Other players, not my own team. So it was just me and a player and a garbage can sometimes or a chair. But my job was to create the scenario in their head and then hold them accountable to go at the intensity and speed they would in the game, which isn't always super fast. Some things are more slow, right? There's a craft to this, right? Deceleration, whatever. Same thing with, with what you're describing. I, I'm going to create the scenario. Here's what's going on. Make them see it. I'll send them a clip before the workout of exactly the things. If I don't think they'll know it with young guys may not. And now let's execute it. I'll film it and then we'll watch it. 
Okay, here's what it looks like in the game. Here's what you did at our gym by yourself. Let's get the two things to parallel better, right? Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Yeah, just, just break, breaking down the simple, the one f- fragmentation of the play or yeah. of, that, of that small movement just to make them a little bit more specific. Yeah, I, I yep. get it. Um, yeah. So deciding, there's one thing that we also talked in, 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 in um, yeah, throughout my career a lot. What's, what's the, how do you decide whether, how much to work on the weaknesses versus to become that elite one skill player uh, that you want to work on that strength to make it even better. You know, that I, I remember just for example, in college, the coach eliminated all the other plays for me, all not plays, all the other situations for me, he wouldn't, which I didn't think it was in that moment. Good. It took away a lot of my skills that I could have developed over the years of playing a pick and roll or driving or handling the ball, but he made me a specialist. He gave me the confidence, had gave me the green light, told all the players that I need to get the ball. My confidence level just rose up and I became a really from a good shooter to a really good shooter. I wouldn't say elite, but a really good shooter. Yeah. And that carried on. Then later on, when I went to Europe, I had to learn how to play the pick and roll, which that kind of set me back. But he made me work on my one elite skill to become very good at one skill. Yeah. So where do you make the decision? Because other other parts of your of your game really are behind. And you kind of decide maybe that maybe he doesn't have a chance to become an elite shooter or elite defender or, you know, and you're working on the skill and you kind of neglecting the other parts of the game. So what's the balance there? Yeah. Well, a lot is based on age and opportunity, right? So the, I, I think the, you, you remember a, a, a European player named from Puerto Rico named Daniel Santiago. Yeah. So I had Daniel for years. In fact, I helped when he was in Europe, but he would come here in the States in the, in the summer. He lived right by where I trained him. And, um, we still try to improve his game despite him being in his thirties, you know, with married with a couple of kids, uh, because we could, uh, but I wouldn't be doing what I would, would have done with him if he was, you know, 21 where I, where we didn't really know what he could be. So, so age has a lot to do with it. I'm a big believer in that because of the way the game is played now that everyone should be able to do pretty much everything. So I have guards that work on backing guys down. If they have the, the body for it, six, five guards can back down six, two guards, you know, and get a post play, post shot. My, all my players have to work on ball handling. My rule is every day you're in the gym, you got to do 10 minutes a day extra, no matter what they do. In many cases, they're not doing any ball handling with their team. So now they're doing 10 minutes for me. If they're doing ball handling in that gym with their coach, they're t- still doing 10 extra minutes. That includes centers. So this year there was a game. One of my players is starting center for a, a good NBA team, not a great one, potentially great. And uh, there was a bad pass. He, he ended up chasing the ball down like 20 feet from the basket. He had like three seconds on the clock. He quickly attacked the rim, made a little move, got a hammer dunk. So I said to him afterwards, hey, what, what happened there? He said, coach, I've been doing 10 minutes balling every day just for that. Just for that one chance I could show I could really dribble the ball. Meanwhile, he's great with dribble handoffs. If he, if he has to dribble out of traffic in, in the half court of the full court, he can do it. You've got to be a basketball player more than ever. You got to be a basketball player. So if I think you have a chance to be elite at something, you're going to get more work at that than you would otherwise. Uh, uh, and I also want to work on weaknesses because that's what will be exploited in the postseason, especially. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give these coaches any way to get into you and keep you from succeeding because you're so weak at any one thing. So yeah, some of it's a feel thing of, I think, man, this guy can be the best shooter in the league. One of the best shooters on his team we'll lean a little bit more into that three point shooting, but not at the expense of the other stuff. You've got to, it, because it, it'll come back to bite you some other way. So, okay. Age is a good, age is a good uh, uh, transition yeah. point because of how, you know, teams, sometimes colleges recruit uh, underdeveloped or younger players because of the upside, but then they neglect the, the, the older players, more mature players that can help right now. The same thing with drafting. You kind of, you, you, you're trying to see upside or downside or what's, what's the, what's the, what's the ceiling there. And what's, what's your take on how far you can improve a 22, 23 year old or how much is, is different probably with everybody. The spectrum is wide of uh, how much they can improve and with, with certain players, depending on different factors. But do you, have you seen over the years of what the cutoff point is of where you feel like that's what players, where players reach their peak and reach their, their highest potential? Because there's players that are coming in the league at a yet, yet later age and they still get better until they're 30. Yeah. I, I don't think we ever, we ever stop. Uh, yeah. Brooke Lopez having a great year this year. Marcus Saul was never a three-point shooter. 
until he was, right? Uh, there, there's no, there, the, the only thing limiting them is imagination and work ethic, inspiration. Uh, I think the best NBA teams are the, are the franchises, are the ones that recognize we can help all our players play better. They can shoot better. They can think better. Their bodies can be better. They can be more fit. Uh, it, they're all young men compared to me. And I'm still trying to get better in, in, as a, just as a human, as a man. Um, it's, it's a naive way to look at it. They're, they're, as your body changes physically, if you watch LeBron James play, he's much more under the rim than ever before. But you know, LeBron is a genius mentally. He's a very, very brilliant guy. And so he's, a, he's figured out how to be successful with his body that's nothing like it was even six years ago, five years ago, four years ago. Uh, that some guys can do it on their own. Most of them need help. That's our job is to help them. One last question before we go into, into the other, because I have some ATOs, I call them, but just quick, quick Q and yeah. Q and A's. Um, yeah. Switching shooting hands. What's your experience with sh switching shooting hands? Up to what age would you switch the shooting hand when you recognize that he's probably shooting with the wrong hand? And what are some indicators maybe that they are shooting with the yeah. wrong hand? So I I've never switched shooting hands, but I understand your question. The, uh, the reason why I've never done it is because I know how to check to see which is your better eye. I, I was, my dad was left-handed. I'm right-handed, uh, but I did everything in my left hand. And so I've, I'm a completely ambidextrous basketball player. I was when I was playing until uh, like outside eight feet. Then I just shot my right hand, but dribbling, passing, uh, shooting around the rim. I was completely ambidextrous because my parents got me to an eye doctor. So basically right-handed people have the dominant right eye. You may know this. There's a way to test it. And so my parents took me to a test. So I, you can do the, t anyone can do it. It's just, you put your thumb, you keep both eyes open. You put your thumb over an object in, in the distance, close one eye, then the other eye, which when the thumb moves, that's the wrong eye. The thumb stays over the, the superimposed target with your good eye. And so if I think a player is missing left and right too much, I'll just give them the eye test. And, and then I just stick with, with that. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm all for like Miles Plumlee's doing it now with uh, Charlotte. He's shooting left-handed jumpers now. I don't know what eye he normally should be, but, and also something might be anatomically wrong with his right arm. I, you know, I don't think everyone ever looked into that, but um, he's doing it and he's 30 years old. So no one else has an excuse not to do it if that's what they should be doing. That's true. That's true. Um, before the QA, the, 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 the trigger, the, the ATOs, I mean, uh, your new endeavor and business, you mentioned that you are planning to open. What's, what's the, what's, what's the background on yeah. that? Just real quick, uh, it's called. It's going to be called uh, my my business called the Pro Training Center. That that's my training business, not my my writing business. True Hoop, uh, the Pro Training Center recruiting is what we're doing. Basically, there there's a very inefficient marketplace between all the players in the world, America and Europe, Asia, that want to play in college, and the colleges that are trying to get them. It's mm -hmm. incredibly inefficient. And so for years, I've been helping for nothing, and I have some guys that I mentor that we've placed, I think the last three years, 38 players who had no offers, none. And then we got them all, whether it's full scholarship or, or in some cases, you know, maybe they pay a thousand dollars a semester, something very small, and they're playing college basketball and they want, they want to do that and do whatever. So we're building a, a marketplace where I'll be very involved initially. Uh, and then we'll do every other sport. I won't be doing the other sports. We're doing basketball first to help anyone from overseas or America find a scholarship And, and have it be at a program that they'll be proud of being part of and hopefully be successful at. We're going to be, and we're also help them play better while they're in high school with my MBA curriculum. The things I do with my MBA players, we're going to share some of that with them so they play better, which will help them earn scholarships as well. You, it, the colleges want good players, so we want to help them play better. So we'll help them play better, and then we'll help find that marriage of player with team, connect them, and have both the colleges happy as well as the players happy. So for now... Just look up Pro Training Center. Uh, look up my name, you know, Coach Thorpe on Twitter. If you want to message me, you can. I'll put you in touch with my person in charge of it once we, we're going live, like within the next week, I think. And we're going to just take a few people at first, but we're going to help European players as well as American players. That's perfect. Yeah, that's why. That's why I thought it was important to talk about because international yeah. players, European players, they, like I, 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 I know what you're talking about, the inefficiency, because a lot of information goes through the hands of, of, of yep. my phone. <laughs> so yeah, there's, exactly there's, right. there's definitely a lot of, lot of information that, that gets lost along, along the way. Um, you ready? All right, yes, sir. All right, let's go. Uh, best, best basketball Twitter follow. Who? 
I, I, I'm, I love John Hollinger of The Athletic, but Basketball Index and NBA University are great too. Best non-basketball Twitter follow? Right now, any doctor discussing health, COVID, there's so many. You just, I'm not an expert on that. You should be following people that are. Uh, you enjoy watching the game now or 20 years ago? Oh, I, I love it now. I loved it 20 years ago too. It's better now, I think. Um, basketball is jazz is your book. Three words to describe it. Love, basketball, decency. Uh, book recommendation that could widen your horizon that may not be basketball related. Oh, man. I wish I prepared for this. I read, I read sometimes <laughs> three books a week. Uh, the, probably the best book right now for Americans, I can't speak for Europeans, is a book called The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis, who's a very famous author. He's, many of his books became movies. It's the best book about government I've ever read if to really understand how government works. I mean, Europeans would probably enjoy it. It's just about our government here in America. And uh, it, you'll understand the government like never before. And it's really entertaining. It's called The Fifth Risk. Fifth Risk. Okay. After so many years, what do you feel is still so hard in your job? Incompetence at the coaching management level. Uh, <laughs> players want to do well. They, there's just so many bad coaches and bad uh, you know, executives that they just really get in the player's way of reaching their full potential. All right. Last two is, is Tim Ferriss questions that, that he likes to ask that I just copy from him. Your favorite failure from, from throughout your career that you feel like that you learned from the most or grew from the most? My favorite failure? Failure, yeah. Failure. Um, probably the unwillingness to, to, uh, to take a college job. I was afraid our marriage wouldn't handle it. My wife insists I'm wrong, but, um, I, I was afraid. I just didn't think, I thought I'd be successful as a coach. I, I want family was more important to me. And, um, you know, I, I probably could add a hell of a career as a head coach. It's worked out fine for me, but I learned not to be so afraid Did not just as an entrepreneur, you can't have fear. And so I really developed a, a steeliness about me that I didn't have before. And last thing that you would put on a billboard for everyone to see, to, to learn from, I think I can guess what it is, but if you could just put a billboard for everyone to see, what would it be? What would be on there? Uh, be decent to each other. Be a yeah. decent person. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would have guessed that from this conversation. Yeah. Coach, thanks a lot. It's been, it's been a pleasure. I love the energy. I love, I love the inspiration. I felt it across the screen and I hope to see you soon sometime in person. Uh, I look forward to it. Be in touch, okay? Yeah, thanks for being here. Take thanks, care. everybody, for listening. Bye.